Ladies and gentlemen, my name's Paul, and in this RetroGamingTank.com video, we're going to be discussing, as well as analysing tech news, which, as usual, has popped up in the past 24 or so hours. Hopefully, you're having an amazing day. We have a couple of interesting stories to get through in today's video. Again, I am working on a reduced schedule in terms of video production, because I am moving but um, I am really interested in talking about a couple of these topics. The first thing I'd like to begin with, though, is Intel's Meteor Lake. Meteor Lake is expected to launch most likely in 2022, although it's possible it may be 2023. It's not 100% certain as of yet. Meteor Lake is actually the successor to Intel's older Lake, and it is a very interesting architecture. Because while Intel currently are getting kicked in the shin by AMD, and we expect the shin kicking to continue with the Ryzen 5000 series, again, we've covered rather extensively the benchmarks for, um, well, the leaked benchmarks thus far, anyway, for the 5000 series. This range of processors is possibly going to be a little different, because it will be utilising a combination of Ocean Cove and Gracemont, if you've been following along with the channel for a while, you'll know that Ocean Cove is one of the architectures I've uh, mentioned is really impressive. So possibly speaking, Intel will be coming back rather heavily. Golden Cove is pretty damn good, but Ocean Cove is even more impressive. Again, though, they will be fighting against, well, really impressive processors from AMD. At the very least we can logically expect them to be up against Zen 4, uh, because Zen 3 will be getting a refresh, as we've discussed on the channel before. So, probably speaking, for the Ryzen range of SKUs anyway, in 2022, there will be Zen 4-based products, because this will be most likely when DDR5 becomes... Uh, standard for desktops. It's looking like it won't be, well, obviously this year, and 2021 is very optimistic. So I think 2022 is a pretty good bet for DDR5 to start to become um, normal for the desktop. So anyway, uh, getting back to Intel, this information comes to us via Linux patches, Linux kernel patches to be precise. And we actually have Meteor Lake uh, patches which have appeared on uh, git.kernel. This is actually courtesy of forenix.com, so of course I will link the article in the description of this video. The patch that we have first is actually for the Intel E100E, which is a gigabyte, uh, gigabit, excuse me, Ethernet Linux driver, and this does not mean, of course, that these CPUs will rely on this, it doesn't mean that they will require it, but even so, there is a patch for it. Um, I will hold my breath on how these perform. At the end of the day, it's going to be just interesting to me how AMD uh, keeps the momentum up. Zen 3 is looking to be extremely profound, as we've discussed before. So I think at about the point that Meteor Lake releases, all the lake such Meteor Lake, Intel would have had time to kind of do a major overhaul of its architectures. That's what the rumour is anyway, that uh, it's kind of like um, Ocean Cove is the real uh, major new architecture from Intel. But again, we can only wait and see if this is the case. I also want to discuss performance figures of NVIDIA's RTX 3070. The 3070 actually does not launch until the 29th of October, which is a delay of about two weeks. There is a reason behind this that NVIDIA have stated publicly, and that is to avoid limited stock at launch. However, it doesn't take a particular genius to figure out that that's not the only reason NVIDIA have done that. It's also to be at least somewhat of a fawn in AMD's side, because AMD announced all of the shiny stuff of the RDNA 2 uh, architecture on the 28th. So again, it makes lots of sense to me for um, NVIDIA to kind of put it back for a couple of reasons. Now hopefully this does mean that stock shortages won't be such a thing. 
we all know the stories of scalpers at the moment for the RTX 30 series of cards, both the 80 and the 90, but to be fair, that also extends to the PlayStation 5 and Xbox um, consoles too in terms of their pre-orders. Hopefully, stores will start putting things in place to you know stop you buying like 25 graphics cards. Um, however, getting back to the point, rather than me ranting... Um, we do actually have uh, some official performance figures for the 3070. And this card, I suspect, is going to be the most popular GPU. Now, NVIDIA are testing these particular GPU, uh, sorry, this particular GPU at 1440p, um, which I think is a pretty good resolution for a card which is like 499. I suspect that it could drive a 4K display as the performance is roughly on par with a 2080 Ti. We'll get to the exact specifics in just a second. However, um, I think that this card is going to be most comfortable a high refresh rate 1440p monitor. And 4K is definitely doable, if, especially if you use something like DLSS. Now, NVIDIA are stating that the 70 versus the... Uh, sorry, 3070 versus the 2070... It's a 60% on average performance advantage. And they state that this is across a plethora of different games, whether it's DirectX or Vulkan, and whether it's ray tracing or just traditional rasterization. So, that's quite a lot faster, to be honest, than the 2070. Obviously, there is the 2070 Super, but they are not comparing it against that. They are, however, um, really making a big point of the 2080 Ti. So the 2080 Ti, when it was released, was about twice the price. Again, I say about because it does depend upon founders edition cards and, you know, gouging from retailers and whether you go with, like, a custom solution for cooling and blah, 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 blah. But the performance figures that we actually have for this particular uh, card do actually paint a very good... Um, picture of what we can expect from these GPUs. So, unfortunately, there are not as many games as I'd hoped for. There are some professional applications, such as Blender, and you can see that Arnold, Blender, um, Luxmark, Redshift, they all do very well with the 3070, which is in green. The lighter grey is representing the 2080 Ti, and then the dark grey is representing the 2070. It's actually a very good little subtle trick of NVIDIA to use those colours because it kind of emphasises that they're not as important, that, you know, this is old and the green is the shiny. At least how I think that's how other people perceive it. Maybe I'm wrong. Let me know. Um, but the games that we have here, such as Doom Eternal, yes, the 3070 is outperforming the 2080 Ti. In other games, this is not the case. Time Spy Extreme, well, I hesitate to say that Time Spy Extreme is a game, but uh, in that particular instance, the 2080 uh, Ti is slightly ahead. And uh, yeah, so Control RTX on the 2080 Ti, again, is about on par, slightly ahead, just pipping it by the uh, post. So in Wolfenstein, though, the... 3070 is definitely ahead, whereas the 2070 just, well, I can't say anything other than it just gets stomped. We are looking at at least a 1.5 relative performance increase over the 2070, and in some games, and some applications, it could be significantly higher. So, for example, Minecraft, we're definitely looking at about 1.6, 1.7, Wolfenstein, again, is probably about a 1.6 performance advantage. That is pretty damn good. I will be very curious to see um, if NVIDIA can keep up with the demand for these GPUs. The specs of it, just quickly, uh, we are looking at 5,888 CUDA cores um, with a... TFLOP rating of 20, not that it makes any difference in gaming performance at all with TFLOP rating, and 8 gigabytes of memory, although it is just GDDR6, uh, which means that we are looking at 448 gigabytes per second of bandwidth, which is obviously considerably less than what we have with the 
3080, which has a tremendous amount of bandwidth, like 760 gigabytes. The 70, though, is going to operate with a TDP of just 220 watts. So not only do you have the fact of, well, it's cheaper, again, 499 versus 699, those are US dollar prices, respectively, but you also need to take into consideration that this would work in a smaller case. You wouldn't need to worry about having such, um, you know, uh, such a beefy power supply. All of those factors do come into it as well. And now we're going to discuss the PlayStation 5 as internets are going crazy again over the amount of space which is available on the PS5's SSD. Uh, there is an image which has leaked which claims that after you take into account OS reserves, we'll discuss what that is in just a second, you have 664 gigabytes of space, um, which is not exactly a huge amount, and that's putting it rather nicely. Well, actually, more precisely, it's... Uh, uh, 664 GIB of space. So the total capacity of the drive is not actually a surprise to me. When you take 825 GB and then you convert it into GIB, um, you're looking at 768 GIB of usable space. This is kind of a thing of how um, hard drives always show less capacity in Windows or Linux or whatever than you actually thought you purchased. People who know quite a bit about technology will probably know about this already, but long story short, hard drive manufacturers, for example, will say that one kilobyte is 1,000 bytes, a megabyte is 1,000 kilobytes, one gigabyte is 1,000 megabytes, I think you kind of get where I'm going with this. Therefore, if you buy a drive that has a capacity of 500 gigabytes, you take 500, multiply it by 1,000, 1,000, and another 1,000, and that gives you the number of bytes on the disk. And obviously, you would adjust the capacity as you would uh, wish to. But this is where the rub comes in. Memory manufacturers don't sell uh, stuff in groups of 1,000 they use 1,024. So if you're buying memory capacity, let's say you have uh, one gigabyte of memory, which is obviously absolutely tiny in today's uh, standards, you are looking at 1,024 megabytes. So if you take that same 500 gigabytes, which is according to hard drive manufacturers, the actual reality is it becomes only about 465 gigabytes, slightly more than that. So is that inaccurate? No, because while it is 35 gigabytes less, in terms of accuracy of terminology, hard drive manufacturers are technically being accurate as they're using gigabytes, because giga is basically a power of 1,000. But when it comes to Windows and memory manufacturing and that type of thing, they basically go by powers of 1024. I'm sure most of you knew that already, but I just wanted to quickly run over it because otherwise I know there's going to be a few questions regarding it. So what does this mean? Well, if you take that into account, and then you take into, uh, sorry, into account the actual uh, operating system uh, reserves, we're looking at the OS taking up 105, sorry, 104 GIB, which again, is kind of what I expected. The Xbox Series X seems to be norming up 128 GIB. But the thing is, we're not certain yet whether this image is actually real. Because one of the things that you can immediately kind of say, well, that looks a bit weird, is you'll notice in the bottom corner, the bottom right corner, that there's actually a black cursor. Now, this can be explained in two trillion ways. The first is that it's fake. The thing is, though, if it's fake, it seems really weird that the person would just not notice the cursor. 
then again, I guess it's possible. It's also possible that they bought it into Photoshop for the purposes of cropping, but then they did a print screen. So again, it's kind of weird that they chose to do this. There are also a couple of um, other images that the user has uploaded as well. And the fact of the matter is that we now know that folks actually have a PlayStation 5 physically. A uh, bunch of Japanese YouTubers have gotten their hands on one, and so we're going to start to see, obviously, videos start trickling out fairly, uh, you know, over the next several days. The thing is, from what I understand, the NDAs for this are still really stringent, and there are still things that Sony are asking to not be shown off, and they're being really secretive. Now, of course, because it's NDAs, it's very difficult to know exactly what is and what isn't allowed to be shown off and not allowed to be discussed yet, because as of the time I'm recording this video, the other videos have not been made live. Um, but let's stick to the space. Honestly, if this image is fake, I still think it's roughly on par with what we're going to get. Um, I've mentioned this like a trillion times by now, so I'm going to just go over it really briefly, but... Storage for the next-gen consoles is not cheap. It's There are a whole bunch of people that are really astounded that the Xbox Series X SSD was like, you know, I, I refer, of course, to the uh, the um, additional storage that you can buy for the Xbox Series X, and they were really amazed it was like 220 US dollars. And I'm like, well, what planet did you expect it to be like, you know, under 100 bucks? There's just no way because of the price of, of NAND memory. And there were some that were asking for it to be uh, Microsoft to eat that cost, but they would go broke trying to do that. It's not a viable strategy. It's like, yeah, sure, losing like 20, 30 bucks on a console, you can kind of offset that, but they can't offset like $100 per, um, per memory sold for the Xbox Series X, and obviously with the PlayStation 5, it's even diff more different because you actually have to concern yourself with non-Sony brand SSDs. Essentially, they are vetting SSDs which will fit into the PS5. Um, so if you buy a, a, a Samsung, for example, a drive, and it fits in the PS5, great, but at the end of the day, it's not a Sony-branded one. They've just said, yep, that works. Um, honestly, this generation is going to be really interesting in terms of storage capacity. The good news is that if you own uh, backwards compatibility titles on either console, you can run those, of course, from internal storage, but I think most people won't do that. They will probably instead use an external device. So you could use, like, a USB SATA um, sorry, a USB uh, SSD, um, which would definitely be one way to go, you know, like an external SSD, or you could even use like a really big, like, you know, four terabyte or whatever hard drive, and you can also transfer games over to, and it doesn't take like a ridiculous amount of time to do that, um, but at the end of the day, it still, it still does mean that you are juggling space. Personally, I'm not intending to buy another another a drive, at least for now. I'm like, okay, you know what? I'm good. Um, I'm just not like willing to cough up that amount of cash at the moment uh, on a set on like external storage. I'm okay, even um, though I I probably assume that I'm going to quickly go over the space that is on the on the consoles. The fact of the matter is that. I'm okay with that. I've got really fast internet, so that's good. But obviously, that's not the same for everyone. So I, I think there will be a lot of juggling going on. With all of that said, though, thank you very much for watching the video. Normal stuff. Like, share, comment, and subscribe. Thanks very much for watching. Take care of yourselves. Bye for now.